well, can you walk out there and tell them not to cheer during the... Hello, I'm Jamie Boone, president of the Atheist Community of Austin. Recently, the board of directors released a statement uh, that has resulted in uh, the ACA being embroiled in a public relations um, kerfuffle, as it were. I'd like to clarify first that the position on trans rights has not changed. However, I would also like to say that the ACA is in communication with the stakeholders involved in this controversy and that we are working hard to reach an amicable and productive solution. The ACA cannot speak for all parties involved, uh, but we are working on this and we will have more info to come. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Atheist Experience. Today is Sunday, May 12th, 2019. I'm Tracy Harris and with me today is our regular co-host, John I. Coletti. Hello. Hello and welcome. Welcome. Happy Mother's Day out there to all you mothers. Yeah, even if you're kitty mom. <laughs> The Atheist Experience is a production of the Atheist Community of Austin, a Texas nonprofit educational organization dedicated to separation of religion and government and the promotion of positive atheist culture. Uh, we do, do want to invite people to come out and join us for dinner after the show at the ACA studio in the Freethought Library where we, were, we are going to have tamales with sides, which sounds pretty awesome. We do take donations, but the meal is free and open to the public, so feel free to come on down. It's at the Freethought Library on Koenig. And that's it. We don't have any special announcements. No. Do you have anything? I don't have anything. I do have one thing that was interesting. It's funny because it's not even atheist related, but I just can't even believe it. Basically, uh, China has vowed to crack down on strippers at funerals. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize I, that was a problem. I, is it, well, is it a problem? That's the question. It's like, first of all, I didn't know it was a thing. <laughs> you know, a lot of people didn't know that was even an option, right? right. Like, you, they, don't, they don't tell you that when you're planning funerals. They don't say, do you want the stripper option here? So Yeah, it's just what kind of casket do you want? Yeah, usually. but apparently there, the more people you can pull into your funeral, like, it's more prestigious. Okay. And so, <laughs> I don't know. I guess, I guess you, that's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Way to go, China. I thought that was kind of wild. The comments on it are pretty funny. But, okay, so, if we have no announcements, I don't see why we can't just go straight into calls. Do you Let, have anything? Let's do it. All right, so let's go ahead then, and we'll just start from the top. We'll go with... Um, number one here, who is Charles from Corpus Christi, who wants to talk about the restoration of Israel and Bible prophecy. Hey, Charles, you're on Hello. with John and Tracy. Um, first of all, there was a concentration camp called Yasinovich in Croatia. It was manned by Franciscan monks. They were killed off. They killed off some Jews. Most of the people there killed were actually Serbs because the Serbs are Russian Orthodox, and the Vatican broke off from the, the Russian Orthodox Church about a thousand years ago. There were also Nazis that took Jews over to the Middle East in order to settle Israel is called the Transfer Agreement of 1933. See, the restoration of Israel is prophesied by Amos 915, Ezekiel 3816, and Zechariah. And Adam, Alan Dulles, the CIA director, he was a Skull and Bones member, he helped finance the Holocaust, and then he helped get Nazis down. All right, so we're moving on to <laughs> Alex, um, who is in Dallas, Texas. Hi, Alex, you're on with Tracy and John, and it says here you want to talk about um, potential harm caused by atheism. Hi, Alex. Hey. Yeah. Hi. Uh, can you all hear me? First of all, Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I was just listening to this guy was going off. Um, yeah, the, so, I think the Skull and Bones reference, you know, it was like, what's next? The Illuminati and the, the Federal Reserve <laughs> speech <laughs> yeah. or something. I'm just like, I, I don't have time for this. So, yeah, go ahead. 
Um, hey, uh, so I, yeah, I called like a couple of weeks ago. Um, I apologize. I went back and I watched the video and I realized that I was very nervous and okay. I started punch and I didn't really get to have the discussion I wanted, so I wanted to call back. Okay. Um, okay. Just thinking about what my argument was. Just All right. Some thoughts. Like, so yeah, I'm like I'm back. Uh, okay. So the first thing I wanted to address was um, I know it's really really hard for I think atheists to believe that I used to be an atheist. Um, actually, I, I, actually, every believer used to be an atheist. So right. I think that we do believe you. But what does that mean? Like, what do you mean that every, every believer used to be an atheist? Did, well, you, did you believe in God when you were born? I mean, so like, sure. I guess, yeah. I mean, so obviously you believe in God because I used to be religious. Obviously, but like, you, you're religious like a little kid is religious, right? Like, parents tell you that, hey, God exists, and you're like, okay. Well, I, I guess what I'm it. saying is most most Christian religions have this idea that at a certain point you sort of profess your belief, right? You you oh. say like, oh, I believe. And so up until that point, you're not really in that camp. So it's when you when you actually understand it, when you can believe it, that's when you would become a believer. But up to then, you probably wouldn't be a believer. So I do believe you that you were an atheist and that you became a, a believer. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, I'm uh, like I'm Hindu, right? Um, That's fine. And yeah. And so my uh, so like obviously I, I mean I was atheist in the sense like I used to watch Bill Maher and like Sam Harris was like I loved watching his videos how he kept down people and stuff like that. Um, and obviously when I am believer, I obviously have a very clockmaker belief in God. You know, like a very the like the clockmaker theory. You're familiar with that, right? Yeah. yeah. So you believe you're like a creationist. Wait, no, no, I'm not creepy. Wait, the God, like, sure, like, God pushed, like, time's arrow. Uh, God created science and physics and math and all that stuff. Like, that's the kind of thing. Like, God. Right, but the watchmaker is basically saying that it's designed, that some, that some intelligence designed the universe, right? Okay. That's creationism, uh, isn't it? Okay, I guess. Um, that's not what I, I don't believe it's a design. I think, you know, it's. Um, well, that's the watchmaker argument. Okay, okay. Unless okay, he's so talking about something else. Well, okay, clockmaker. Um, I'm trying to understand. Like, Hinduists believe in um, something called the Brahman, which is, like, it's the everything. It's the all reality, all consciousness, all knowing. Like, it's the culmination of, of I don't know how to just put this into words, and I think that's why we call have a word for it. But it's, like, the um, a culmination of, um, of science, um, a, like, a, of life. I don't know. It's uh, it's a very so atheism is harmful because. Okay, yeah. So let's go into that. Um, the reason why I think so, we talked about politics in the um, in the last time when I was here, and I asked you what you guys believed in. I know Tracy wasn't a fan of capitalism. I don't know what John believes in. Um, if John is a fan of capitalism or not, um, what I wanted to say, uh, in, this is often misquoted, which is uh, a Karl Marx um, quote on on religion is that it's a opium of the people, meaning that it's a harmful thing. But he believes in capitalist societies where people live disillusioned lives. Um, uh, religion can be that opium, um, a sort of um, medicated, um, a medicated concept to help them when they when they are exploited workers, when they suffer worker alienation, when they are paid low jobs, live low standards, live their day paycheck to paycheck. Um, so like, a question I have for atheists often it sounds very very absurd which is why don't you just kill yourself it's like there's no God right and I know it sounds absurd but like that's a genuine question I have is like um like why like why do you like there's no obligation for anyone any of us to be here uh, do you think for example that do that a dog believes in a God that the gods are the and dogs are theistic do you have any reason to think that's true no uh, okay do dogs value their lives uh, wait, what? Do, do dogs value... If you try to kill a dog, will it fight back? Uh, of course, yeah. Okay, why? Um, well, I don't think dogs have, like, the complexity of understanding the world like we do. So what? Uh, they value their lives and they don't believe in a god. Is this baffling okay, to sure. you? Sure, I guess... Okay, okay. Um, that's true. I think some people do have uh, a, like, evolutionary design to stay alive, survive... Um, and there's some people that like that don't, if, especially if you're if you are like what I described, like a lot of, a large portion of the world that lives like a very very exploited life that's meaningless. 
Um, I mean, I'm, I'm like I consider I don't consider myself like a, like a socialist ish, but I do consider I do look at the world through some kind of Marxist lens where I do think that like some people live very unfulfilled. Um, so atheist like, is like, harmful because why? Right. So like the reason why atheism it can be harmful is that like without that like spiritual um, guidance, I think that like people live like people's lives like are like it's miserable. I think. So wait a minute here. What what is spiritual guidance? Um. Um. Hold on, let me try to think what I'm trying to say. I don't think atheism can be harmful. I think that's. I think that is wrong. Um, I think I'll, again, I want to go back to but, but, uh, the call that last time, which was I guess religion can be useful um, because my, I think my thesis is going to be religion can be useful in times of helping people do those things. And I don't think do that's what things like, like help people like um, a be. Like being opium for people is like. Kind Why of, is that a good thing? Why wouldn't it be a better thing for people to realize they're being exploited and to work to change it instead of just being of complacent? Course. Okay, so so a, so a, appeasing people who are in a situation that's intolerable um, seems to me like a bad solution, not a good solution. I think that those aren't mutually exclusive, right? To like. Well, sure it is. If if you're if you're the the idea of it being the opiate of the masses is that it keeps these people suppressed, right, and depressed to a point that they just go on and they don't worry about it and they don't do anything about it. They're not mm -hmm. activating. They're they're accepting of it. And I'm saying that I think that's probably not a good reaction to being exploited and abused. Yeah, because they don't act to change it. I agree. I agree with that. I mean, uh, I do. I do think that. Um um, I do, I do agree with that. Now, I will um, say, if this helps you out some, let me just be, <laughs> let me give you, a, let me give you some help. Um, I do think that you know, religion takes advantage of certain things that are helpful to people, right? Like it's a good social network tool. Okay, mm -hmm. so there are things that religion does really well. Um, and I agree that in those ways it can be helpful. There are a lot of people with families who appreciate the fact that they can like go to a church and do certain service-oriented things and bring their kids and have cookies and sing songs and all of that. And I think right. that there are, especially the more liberal churches and the more tolerant churches are great uh, you know, areas where people can find this sort of non-oppressive religious response where they can then go and still have a happy time with their family. There are some organizations like the Unitarian Universalists did I say that right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. they um, have that same model, and it's more of a civic thing where they're open to people that believe and don't believe and whatever, and they use that same kind of model because it actually is a good model, and it does actually serve to, you know, bring people together and to, to, to create a society and community with people. So I don't think that, um, you know, religion does nothing well. In fact, I think it does it does bring people together in a real obvious, you know, an indisputable way. Um, the question is, what do they do with the people once they have that? You know, and some groups do better things, and some groups do not better things. Oh, but an if, another question is: is is the religion sure. necessary for any of that? Is the religion necessary to help other people or to right. you know, get together in community and have cookies or have pizza or have tamales, uh, which <laughs> is what we're doing here? Interject a little bit. Sure. Um, I read. I remember reading um, what a lot of your fans think, and I think a lot of your fans are ardent fans of like capitalism. Um, and like, um, I don't think they see a problem with it. I think they do see that like socialism has killed like a billion people or whatnot. Um, and I think to those people, I think it's hard to. I have like, oh, I, I worded it. Um, the way I wanted to say it was, um, is that like. I think without, so the way I always saw it was that religion, never mind. I think, I think, I, I think I've come to the conclusion. I think okay. religion can do some good things. Religion can do some bad things. Yeah, I mean, like the point is, I'm not here to like, you know, prove a point and like, you know, we're not scoring points. Like I wanted to have a dialectic, wanted to come to the truth, right? Because I think about these things and talking to an atheist would help me arrive to okay. what I believe is true, right? Well, I mean, I'm okay <laughs> talking with you. I've had an okay yeah. time chatting. Right. There, I did want to respond to the because because you asked me you asked me explicitly if I'm a I'm trying to figure out my thoughts is like I do say that you guys point right I don't want to believe that like oh I'm right I'm right 
Okay. So, um, John had a question yeah. for you or something. Well, I wanted to respond because you asked me if I was a fan of capitalism, which I think is a kind of a yeah. strange question. But, um, you know, I, sure. I, I think you will find atheists to be all across the political spectrum. It's really doesn't have anything to do with whether you believe in a God or not. Uh, personally, I think capitalism does some things very well and it does some things not so well. And in this country, we're kind of indoctrinated towards capitalism as being the best thing. And uh, we're not really truly capitalist, I guess. We have elements of all kinds of things uh, with the way our political system works. So am I a fan? I don't, you know, that's to me is a strange question. I, I, I think it's, it is what it is. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, do you, I mean, when I say fan, my question is, do you think it does more harm, does good? Do you like, anyways, uh, yeah, I guess it's a very nebulous question. Um, I, I agree with that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we've like, I think we've, uh, I think I agree okay. with you guys. I think you guys have changed my mind. Um, I mean, again, like I don't, I come here to have. No, it's totally cool. I appreciate like, the fact that you use the show as a way to kind of think your way through stuff and get feedback. Right. And I think it's totally fair for you to at any point say, you know what? I need to go and think about that some more. Um, I think that's totally fine. And if, if, if that's the end of the conversation and it's just like, hey, you've given me stuff to think about, I'll go think about it. Maybe I'll call back later, maybe not. Um, I think that's totally okay. All right? Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, um, thanks. I, oh, is that? I have like, ideas about certain stuff, but like, I'll call you back, right? <laughs> All right. Well, thanks very much, Alex. That's good. Thank you, Alex. Okay. So now we're moving on to... Matthew in Nashville, Tennessee, who says the science proves evolution as much as creation. You're on mm. with Tracy and John. Hi, Tracy. Hi, John. Hey, Matthew. Hey, Matthew. Welcome um, to the show. So it, I guess my contention is, is that uh, atheists are always claiming that there's no evidence for creation or a creator. And, and my contention would be that there's a, plet a plethora of evidence, just just as, as you guys claim to have a plethora of evidence for uh, evolution. I believe the evidence. The now wait, wait, wait! I just want to make sure that we understand we're atheists, not biologists, right? So I'm not the one no, promoting right, right. evolution. And I want to no, ask. I understand that. Why does right, it ahead, matter? Why does it matter? Why does what matter? Well, I know Christians who believe evolution is correct, and I know Christians who believe evolution is incorrect, right? I know theists sure. who believe in evolution and theists who don't believe in evolution. So why is why is creationism or evolution important to you? Uh, so basically, all right. So uh, Christians, um, Christians make a, a distinction between I, – now, I understand that from the scientific – point of view that micro and macro evolution are the exact same process, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of theists or Christians in particular misunderstand uh, the micro evolution to be solely horizontal adaptation within the same species. Does it matter? Does that make sense? Right, but does it matter? I mean, if somebody misunderstands a thing and we're looking at the question of does a God exist or not and the thing itself can be believed or not believed and God is still accepted, does it matter? Ah, uh, you know, I, I actually, that's, a, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting question that I hadn't given a lot of thought to. But it, it, what I gather most from atheists is that God is disproved because evolution, right? And I know that's not a logically sound argument. No, that's a and horrible I, argument, yeah. in fact. That's, yeah, a, that's that, an that awful a argument. argument. Yeah. Would you agree with me that many atheists would, would put forth, many, maybe, many of the laity of the atheists would put forth would put forth that argument because I, I heard it. Okay, here's the thing. I think that atheists and creationist theists spend a lot of time arguing over something that has no bearing on whether or not a God exists. It's a weird thing to me. I, I would agree with you. Yeah. Are we going to do that today? Uh, no, no, no. That, that, that okay. was not my intention today. My intention <laughs> okay. was to actually gain some clarity on the subject, right? Um, a clarity uh, on I evolution not, or clarity on atheism? Uh, maybe more clarity on atheism, right? Okay, There's, okay. I'm, I'm very familiar with the – so I'm a Master's of Divinity student, um, and I have a minor in philosophy, and I'm very, very, very well – Acquainted with the classical atheists, but this new atheist, uh, new new atheism, like uh, that people like like one of the your co-hosts Matt Dillahunty and and Sam Harris and Aaron Raw uh, put forth is something that I'm not so 
that seems to be this this idea of, oh, well, I'm not saying that God doesn't exist. I'm saying that I withhold my belief in God until there's sufficient evidence. Well, actually, right? the, that wait, but, well, wait a minute. Agnostic. Wait a minute. You said that you said that you are a student of philosophy. And I actually have a friend that's also a student of philosophy. I'm trying to remember his name right now. Uh, Austin Klein. And he had an article, I don't know if it's still up, but it was literally going back and looking at the definition of atheism through all different types of dictionaries, including philosophical dictionaries, that showed both definitions, both the not believing and believing not. Um, And so this has been a definition that has been in use for literally a couple centuries now. You know, I would would agree with you. Um, I would agree with you and also synonymous with with those definitions, right, would be would be agnosticism, right? Like, if you look it up on Google right now... Right, but I mean, you, you would, would you agree that atheism deals with belief and agnosticism deals with knowledge? Um, that's yes, Gnostics, yes, right? That's yes. what the word means. And so you've got the subset of belief, you're asking for explanation, and so I'm helping. A, uh, a Gnostic or an agnostic is making a claim of knowledge or not knowledge. And belief is not quite at that level, right? So belief is about holding something to be true or not true. Um, knowledge is when you have great confidence in that assessment, right? Like a like a high level of sure, confidence. Right. And so Fair enough. they're not completely um, completely divorced from each other. But you could be, for example, somebody who believes in God but says, I don't have direct knowledge of that God. I don't believe I have direct knowledge, right? I believe that there is a God, but I don't. Uh, I don't claim direct knowledge. You could also be a theist who says, I believe there is a God, I'm a theist, and I do have direct knowledge of God. God communicates with me directly, and I believe I have knowledge of God, what he thinks, what he wants for me in my life. So there are both camps, right? Yeah, I believe you just described Christians and like the more deistic type. Right, there's two different, so you could have a, a, a person who believes in God but says, I don't have a great deal of knowledge about that God. And you could have somebody who says, I believe in God and I do have a great deal of knowledge about that God. And atheism okay. works the same way, right? So there are some atheists who would say, I feel super strongly that there is no God. And then you have other people who are like, I don't believe it. Um, I, I can't demonstrate it to you, but I see no reason to accept it as true. Right, and they would tend to argue that okay. that is the default position in their mind is to not accept it until you have good reason to do so. They feel there's not good reason to do so. Obviously, the theist would say there is good reason to do so. Right. I appreciate uh, Tracy. I appreciate your. I appreciate your your graciousness. One, um, and and uh, and the fact that you realize that there is a lot of over. Well, not a lot, maybe, but there is some overlap between the two. Right, belief and knowledge are like you know tied together in some ways. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, my my next contention would be a kind of it, it, it. We really do get into a gray area here in these discussions, and that's why they're, for the most part, at least what I found, they're irresolvable. Right? I mean, they're irresolvable issues essentially between the theist and the atheist. Um. Oh gosh, I lost my train of thought. Where That's was okay. I going with this? Take a moment, <laughs> have a drink of water, um, think for a second, see if you yeah. can get it back. I understand what that's like. I lose my train of thought more often than I'd like to, and it's not comfortable for me either. And more uh, often, no, as we not go. at all. Um, I, I, I'm just glad Matt's not on the show. I'm going to call back next week if, when he's there because I've got the. I've no, got the, I'm here again. To, I'm going to be here again next week because Matt took two weeks. So call a week from next week. <laughs> Gotcha. But Tracy, you actually, you've been a pleasure to talk to, honestly. Okay. And, and I'm, I I have a very good friend of mine um, by the name of Alex, and he actually, uh, he is an atheist, and I was a, I, I still am to this day a, a hardcore theist Christian. Um, and he actually taught me the very first things I, I knew about logic and argumentation, right? Okay. And once once he taught me about those things, I was much better at presenting arguments and recognizing fallacious arguments. Okay, good. Um, my, the, the, another contention that I found or that I have with atheism, uh, especially like atheisms like uh, some of the more broad or, or bold atheists like Christopher Hitchens, right, is that he will he will straight out say God does not exist, or Christopher or uh, Dawkins, for instance, will say, yeah, you know, God is dead. There is no God. Actually, 
actually, he yeah, says he says probably not. He has a scale. Yeah. Dawkins actually doesn't do a binary thing. He has the scale that he uses where he sort of says like there's a percentage of belief. I think I, if I remember right, and you know, don't kick me if I get it wrong because I'm <laughs> working from years sure ago. No. But I think he said he was somewhere at a seven out of ten or something I, like that. Five out of six or something. Yeah. I don't remember. see. They're already contradicting me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, but he, but he's somewhere on a scale. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why he would. He would. He would. He would write a book and author it and call it the God Delusion. Then, right? If he was on a scale, right? That seems to. That seems to me that he's implying that all theists are subject to a delusion. Which, yeah, which I can understand all or, your view. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so the problem that I would have with that then is now we're making claims about reality. Sure. And if we're making claims about reality, we're no longer withholding belief based on a lack of evidence. Right now we're now we're injecting our own beliefs. Uh, that, well, but I mean, okay. Here's the thing, though. Too, even right? though, even though I will allow for a distinction between belief and knowledge in in the confidence levels, I do have to acknowledge that when someone expresses a belief, they are asserting that that thing aligns with reality. They are saying that it's true. Right. So if somebody if I ask you if you believe a claim and you say yes, you're saying that you accept it as true. So you accept it as being reflective of that it maps to reality for you. Right. I I agree. I agree. And that's the same for that's the same for everyone. So you're so when we say to me, the you know, there's like the fine line between belief and knowledge, because when you once you start asserting something as true, um, you are expressing like belief, right? And so then for for the atheists that say, you know, I believe there is no God, they are certainly asserting that that maps to reality as true. And then you have right. other atheists who are saying, I believe that it maps to reality as true that I don't know whether there's a God or not and I'm not going to commit to it. Right, Which so is the more agnostic of the of the brand, I guess. Right, yeah, sure. I mean, if you want to um, call it, if you want to label it that, that's fine. But it's still just about a belief position. It's saying that I'm not convinced enough to to map this to reality as true. I don't accept the claim as true. It doesn't mean they're sure. calling it false. And if if uh, you know, I'm not worried too much about the labels. I think we're on the same page as far as what we're describing. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Again, you've been really gracious. There's some things that I, I do want to talk to Matt about, um, but okay. that, 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 that has to do with the validity, the validity of the Bible, and we can, we can go run around about that the other day. You've been very gracious. One more question, and then I know you have Last one. Yes, last dude. one. <laughs> All right, last one. Uh, let me choose my words very carefully here. Um, Let's see here. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I know exactly what I was going to ask. Okay. What do you, in your opinion, uh, and your co-host's opinion, I don't know his name or John. His, her name? John. 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 It's John. John. I'm sorry, John. John, I'm sorry to, to have, have ousted you from this conversation. <laughs> that was not my intention, sir. I, I'm actually but, doing that. I need to let John talk. <laughs> no worries. Um, in, 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 the, in, in the opinion of, of you two, what would be some methods or what would be some what would be uh, uh, some ways that the theist and the atheist could meet in the middle per se and and have more productive dialogues with each other the way you and I have here right because so often I see it turns into mudslinging and pe- and when that happens people stop listening and they start in with the ad hominems and they start in with the, with the straw men right H- how can we resolve this problem and how can we meet in the middle and and just really iron out the wrinkles in in the belief systems here um and and the world views I think you just need to have a conversation. You need to listen to what the other person is saying and not what your preconceptions about them are. Um, sure. I may not agree with you, but I'm listening to what you're saying and I'm considering what you're saying and hopefully vice versa. And and you just like, like you and Tracy are talking today, you just you listen to each other, you say what you think and, and uh, try not to make it a, uh, you know, like, turning into what I would call a pissing contest where you're just trying to... Yeah, exactly. Where you're right. trying to, down, you know, make the other person look uh, look foolish or whatever. Well, it's like the last caller, right? The last caller actually made a comment that was something similar to 
Um, I'm not calling to, to vet who's right or wrong here. I just have questions and I'm calling to ask questions so that I can get information and think about this some more. And, you know, initially he said at the end of the call, I think you changed my mind. But the point is, even if we, even if that, even if he hadn't said that, even if he just was like, I'm going to take this information, I'm going to go think about it. I mean, to me, that's fine, right? I, I just want a sincere conversation. What I don't want is a person to call up to try to promote their agenda. And I'm not trying right, to, sure. like, promote an agenda. Obviously, I'm here presenting on behalf of an association. But at the same time, um, the whole point to this show is about just having atheists engage with with the, the public to try and make the the idea of an atheist more human, right? Because we well, get really right, badly sure. maligned, right? And um, there's, sure. some, there's some horrendous studies that show how the public thinks about atheists. Mm -hmm. And so it's really good for us to have a show where atheists just engage people and we have conversations like this that just sort of... Of, um, help with understanding, right? That we are human but, beings and, yeah. And it may be productive yeah, like or it may not right be productive. Right now. Yeah. So. Now, I mean, this is one avenue of having those conversations, right? But it's up to people, too. And so I think that for me, I, I, I kind of quick cut that first call off, right? When I get a caller that I'm just like, I don't know if you're trolling, I don't know what you're pushing, I don't know what it is you're trying to prove to me, but I don't feel like I'm having a sincere conversation. I feel like you're trying to lead me down paths and get me on some script that you already have in your head, not you, but like the person calling, that, that I'm, no, supposed, I'm supposed to respond a certain way and then you're going to do your gotcha moment. <laughs> and it's just like that to me is so boring. That wasn't right. even a conversation. So that was a that was a a, a one way diatribe. I think. Yeah, that was a whole little bit different. But I'm just saying that when I when I feel like I'm engaging somebody who's not interested in hearing me, who's like literally preaching or monologuing to me, um, right? I have zero interest in engaging them. And part of that is what you're talking about, because what you're saying is, so how do we have more productive conversations? And for me, part of having more productive conversations is not wasting time on the unproductive ones. Mm -hmm. So when you run into sure. somebody who can't have an honest conversation, cut that loose and go talk to somebody who can. And the goal is not Absolutely. about beating somebody or winning or proving your point. It's just about going and saying, let's exchange ideas. And if you walk away unconvinced, but with something to think about, and I walk away at least understanding you better and having something to think about, then we've done something. I completely agree. And I think, I think one caveat I'd like to add to that is also you guys have done a, a tremendous job of providing a platform here. And so we want to inform the audience also, right? Yeah, From yeah. both perspectives. That's exactly yeah. right. That's why these calls are aired, right? And I, I sometimes describe it as the, the hour and a half that ACA has live telephone operators that answer questions about ACA in the atheist community and help as, you know, just like if you would have an operator at a, at a, uh, like an animal shelter, for example, and people call in, they want sure. information, they want to talk, they have a problem or they have some ideas or they have an issue and they just, you know, talk it through with that person who's answering the phone, whose job it is to help them with resources or help them with information or help provide them a better understanding of what they can provide or what they can't. And it's just, I mean, that's literally what we're doing here. And then they put it on the air. Right? It's like they broadcast it so that everybody sees it, but literally I'm answering the phones just like any association volunteer would answer phones. It's just that I'm on a public platform doing it. Absolutely. And I thank you so much, Tracy and John. Sure. Um, I won't take up any more of your time. I know you have other callers to get to. Thank I'm you. going to enjoy the rest of your show. Thank <laughs> you for having me on. All right. Well, thank thanks very so much. much, Matthew. All right. So we are moving on. This is like the quickest calls I've ever done. <laughs> We're moving on to... Uh, this is Dave in the UK who wants to talk about transitioning out of religion. You're having an issue shedding tra traditions and habits, and you're on with Tracy and John. Hi, Dave. Hi, guys. How you doing? Good. Um, so um, just to add a little bit of context, if you, if you don't mind, um, around four weeks ago, I went on a weekend away with church, and um, it was really problematic. I started to challenge a lot of the ways that I thought about church just because it was one of those where they're speaking in tongues and they're saying, run around and we're all going to shout, Jesus is alive. Okay. Um, so my my question is, um, since then, I've been really just challenging a lot of my beliefs, but the it's been years and years and years of me following this religion. So it's so predominant in everyday life. My question is, how do you let go of those things? Um, how do you get back to a point where they're 
there's not prompts constantly about religion in everyday life. Might be something better for you to address because I never had to do that. He's talking to me, not you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> address it uh, yourself. <laughs> no, that's not. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm looking at Tracy. If you're not watching yeah, the screen, yeah, I don't screen. know if you can see. But the... uh, yeah, I never had to shed belief, so um, I could sort so of when speak you're talking, academically. When you but... talk about prompts in life, like, can you define for me a little bit better? I did hear what you said, but I don't. I don't know if I caught quite what you meant by that. Sure thing. So, like, like for example, first thing in the morning, uh, the thing that you would do is kind of pray. Um, if something good happens, you would your mind switches over to God. Um, think things just just like really general things like that. But the the issue is like it's tied into so much of it's kind of all consuming to the point that I'm trying to let go of them and get to a point of where I can actually challenge them. But I still have it juxtaposition. Okay, with. so I mean, do you at this point they've got you listed as a theist? What is your what is your position on God's existence at this point? This is this is the the thing I I I don't know and um I can't see the any logic behind it. That's the difficulty now. Right, before. but does that change how you feel about it? <laughs> yes, it okay, does. Okay. Okay. Um, so the but the the sorry, I'm not getting the words out correctly. That's but, okay. Um, take your time. Um, it is a case of. My mind's constantly going back to religion, and the, for example, you mentioned before about the community aspect. Um, it's a case of now walking away from community and and, and friendships and relationships that I have with people. Um, it's it's walking away from almost a lot of the morals and the values that I were built on religious um, texts, and yeah. now I'm having to reestablish um, myself. And it's like, where do I go from? here when I know the thing that I used to be extremely devoted to um, is, is, is crumbling. <laughs> I'm trying to think of how to craft a response here. Um, there's a lot to unpack there, right? So this isn't just about the prompts. So you've got the prompts, but you've also got loss that you're dealing with, right? Yeah. Um, you're leaving the church. Was that like a public sort of thing? Are there people that were in touch with you outside of church that you now have to deal with those situations as well? Yeah. So I, first thing I got was um, a message after the first week I didn't go to church saying, hey, I noticed you weren't in. Um, and then I kind of was messaged saying, look, I, I noticed the absolute exploitation and manipulation that was going on at that event. And it was horrible. And they were like, oh, come for a coffee. We'll talk about it. Blah, blah, blah. And they just saw it as like they're trying to reel me back in. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's, yeah, it's it's walking away from community now. And that's what's difficult. It's, it's okay. friendships, it's family, it's pretty much a lot. Do you have friends and family who are not part of the church that you attended? No, not really, no. Okay, so that's everybody for you. Yeah. Okay, so I think the first thing that you want to do, even though you're talking about how to respond to a feeling that you, you know, should be praying first thing in the morning, I actually think your number one priority should be in finding a local community that you can get support from. All right. Cause, because it sounds like there's that to me is the bigger issue here. The ha the habitual stuff and the feelings of all the habits will fade over yeah, time. Your habits will change. You've only been away for a week. And so I think for you, part of kind of calming down and de-stressing is going to be locating a group near you. Are you in, are you near any large towns? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Okay. Near uh, Manchester. Okay. It's busy. possible that they have a humanist group or a free thinkers group. Um, maybe in the UK, I don't know if they have like specifically atheist groups. They might. I know that there's some in Scotland. Like I have a friend that's a you know, Scottish guy with the with with atheists in Aust in uh, Scotland. But if I were you, I would start looking for humanists um, in the UK. I would start looking for um, free thinkers. I would start, you know googling these terms, right? Skeptics. Um, try to yeah. find those terms and see in in that town. Type in like skeptics plus that large metropolis near you. Type in humanist plus that metropolis near you. Now, I will give you a heads up that I've had conversations with some of the folks in the UK and some of the humanist groups are very different than what we consider humanist groups here in the US, right? So um, they actually have a lot more strong atheist views. Um, here in the US, humanist groups are really more kind of concerned about 
um, just doing social positive things. And in the UK, some of the groups that I've heard about or you know had interactions with were, were a lot more, um, I'm going to say anti-theistic. And I don't know if I'm broad brushing this, and I apologize if I am. And if you're part of a humanist group in the UK and you're saying, hey, whoa, no, that's not my experience. That's not what we do. I don't mean to imply that that's like every humanist group. I just know that some of my friends that are involved with those groups in the UK describe um, a much stronger anti-theistic uh, leaning, and that could be isolated, right? It could just be that those are a minor few groups. But I do want to give you kind of a heads up on that. But if you need support, that's the first thing you're going to have to do is is you're not going to have your friends, you're not going to have your family around. How is your family reacting to this? So they're not aware. Um, <laughs> thankfully, that person that I've spoken to hasn't um, spoke to them. But um, it, sound, it sounds about right. I mean, replacing a community with a different supportive community rather yeah. than just completely detaching from everything. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it could be that the community that you reach out to that you find um, is literally like we go to the pub once a week, right? And it might not be the, the same level of connection that you're getting from your church group. Um, but it'll still be people that you start. can connect with and reach out to and maybe yeah. start forming some bonds with. I would, you know, try your luck with maybe a couple different groups if you can find them. Just see where you fit best. Um, but you definitely have to start there. The other stuff will fall into place. Those feelings that you're having of religious obligation will start to fade um, as time goes by. It's just a matter of you, you know, not being away from it that long. Yeah, yeah. The only other question off the back of that, thank you, by the way, uh -huh. um, would be how did you, at the point of leaving your, your religion and, and coming towards atheism and then becoming an atheist, begin to establish, I know you talk a lot about um, how you build your values and a lot of people will say, well, you, we have a... a we have a, a mm. scripture. That's how we build our values and our Oh, yeah. Beliefs. So, yeah. I mean, basically what you're saying is that the rug has been pulled out from everything. Yeah, yeah. And you feel like now you're looking around and there's this pile of rubble where structure used to be. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's that. It's, it, religion has a large structure of how you structure your day, your life. Your, it makes everything your easy. Right? It makes yeah. it all easy. Yeah. It's right there in Stop the book. Stop making decisions. <laughs> yeah, it's all black and white. Well, in your case, I guess it was charismatic, so it's God speaking to people and reaching people and touching people and stuff like that. Yeah. But, um, but the point is there is no easy solution. It's not like you can go grab the, the other manual and it's going to like, <laughs> you know, and read it and there's your answers. The hard work now is all the stuff that religion basically told you was so easy you now get to do the work of putting your nose to the grindstone and rebuilding from the ground up and literally having to question everything. And what I can promise you is that as much as you question and as much as you rebuild, 10 years from that day that you started this journey, you will look back on it and realize, oh my God, I'm still carrying these religious ideas with me that I thought I didn't even know, you know were in my head. These still these, these religious prejudices, these religious religious attitudes and judgments, it's so hard to ferret that stuff out of your brain once it's been driven in there so deeply and so pervasively. It's almost like somebody taking a, a glass and shattering it in your brain and all the little shards just go everywhere. And now the job is to like try and go find them and yeah. to to fix your those pieces of your brain and put in something there that isn't the glass, the shattered glass. And it's, it's tough, right? It's tough because you're going to have to ask a lot of people about their views on things. You're going to have to start looking around at how other people formulate these things. The main thing is just get as much information as you can possibly get, and then you take that away and you consider it, and you think to yourself, what fits with Dave? Right, like, what, what is what is what is a fit for Dave here? Like, can I? Yeah. Does this resonate with me? Does this not resonate with me? Because you're t literally you're talking now about core values, which are not really um, necessarily logically derived, right? Like, what you care about. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you're going to have to look at who you are now and rebuild your identity from the ground up. Basically, there's something called achieved identity. Um, if you want to look up. Uh, 
identity, uh, achieved identity, foreclosed identity. Google some of this and just look at identity theory and you'll start seeing like how your identity develops and what has happened to you. And I think that what's going on is that you're coming out of something called a foreclosed identity where you basically accepted some things very, very committedly that were yeah. not deeply investigated. And now yeah. what you're basically saying is, I, I can't just go and commit to something like that without investigating it again. And how do I investigate it? 100%, yeah, yeah. And you, you, what you mentioned there, like accepting something without investigating it. The way that I would investigate things is go, okay, here's some proof. Let's read a, a book written by a Christian author on how I can go, like how I can look at this in a, from a Christian perspective to try and keep my faith rather than actually just challenging it from a much more logical sense. Yeah. Um, um, but what, uh, and yeah, it's 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 true that it's a case of rebuilding. Um, but if anything, it's a bit more authentic rather than yeah. just. And this is a big reason why I personally get a, get kind of pissed at the dismissiveness of people who say, "Oh, indoctrination is just like educate. It's just education." And it's like you've gone to school, I assume, Dave, like regular school. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you've been to school and you've been to church. Do you think indoctrination and education are the same thing? No. Right. And so when people say that, I just it's like I just want to punch a wall because <laughs> yeah. it's not the same thing. And if you'd ever had your head screwed with in the way they screw with your head when they indoctrinate you, you would never say that learning math is just like that. <laughs> Right? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, no, this yeah. messes up your reality. If someone came yeah. to me tomorrow and said, hey, math is wrong, it would screw up some things for me, right? Not yeah. too much. But, I mean, I would be able to adjust or whatever. But what you're describing is how this screwed up your whole, the, the entire foundation of your life just got ripped away. Yeah, that's it. And, and boom. Well, at the end of the day, it's a it is an opportunity to rebuild. Um, it's an opportunity to let go of the things that I kind of accepted blindly and actually test things, um, which I think maybe is the structure that I'm looking for. It's a one which is comes from trial and thought and investigation as opposed to blind acceptance. Right. Um, but thank you. I yeah, really appreciate sure. that. I really appreciate your time as well. Yeah, be true to yourself though. That's the main thing. When you rebuild your identity, make sure that the stuff you attach to yourself feels like Dave and that it, that it reflects you and your values and what you think is, is the way to go. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And let us know, Dave. Have a great evening now. Let, let us know, oh, Dave. Let us know, Dave, how you're doing in a little while. It's 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 going to be a kind of a long and 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 I'm sure painful. Yeah. Feel free to check in. And uh, and I just want to wish you the best and and let us know how it goes. Yeah. Totally. Thank you. I'll be sure to check in. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Have thank a great, you. <laughs> a great day. Is it for you guys? <laughs> it's Mother's Day yes. here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank Have you. Have a great Mother's Day. Bye okay. Bye bye. Woo, okay, so we're hitting that. We got through the initial round of the theist callers, and we do have two atheists who've been waiting since the beginning of the show, so we're going to go ahead and hit right now. Um, looks like, is it Gianna from Houston? Yeah. Hello? Okay, and you're married to a theist, raising children without indoctrination, and um, you're talking to Tracy and John. Hey, yes, so we're not married yet, but... We're going to be and then that brings up the question of like how we want to raise our kids okay do, do like you have kids last... wait do you have kids or are the kids like a future thing future thing future okay, okay near future thing okay mm -hmm. so that being that's basically like what you're talking about in the last call like you don't i don't want my kids to be indoctrinated into this because that's what he wants basically he wants to teach them what he's been raised to do and, like, I personally don't want that for our kids, but I also want to respect his values. What is his religious tradition, if you don't mind me asking? He's just non-denominational Christian. That's scary. Okay, I was non-denominational <laughs> Christian. It's different, just to let people know, it's very different than interfaith. It's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Non-denominational can mean very extremely conservative Christian. I don't know what yeah. brand of it your fiancé is, but is there a sign in front of the church? Does it it's identify? Like it's it's a Hispanic church. It's basically like Iglesias Enfoque, something like evangelical Christians, a family. Okay. Mm. 
Um, do you, have you been to this church? Have you met anybody at the church or anything like that? I have. Okay. I have. Am I wrong or am I right? Like, is it are, is it a conservative tradition or not? Yes. It is. Okay. Pretty conservative. Okay. Yeah. And, and people get drawn off track with that because there's, um, I think it was in the book, The Good News Club. I just want to do this as silent. The Good News Club, she talks about how in the flyers for this little church group that was at her kid's school, they used non-denominational. A lot of people didn't know what that meant. And they thought that it meant mm-hmm. like interfaith or they yeah. were open to everything. And it's like, no, this means yeah, you're going to hell if you're not a member of our group. That's what that means. So if you see non-denominational, don't think that that means tolerant because it's like the opposite of tolerant Mm. in most cases. Now, if there are people who are exceptions to that that carry a non-denominational flag, I, you know, my apologies (laughs) for broad brushing you. But but in my experience, non-denominational is kind of an ugly thing in general. And you, you know, you you carry that baggage with you from your brethren who are more conservative. Apologies for what you have to deal with. Um, so with you, you you're, you're going to marry somebody who's basically kind of out of a tradition similar to what I came from. And why? Well, we usually don't talk about religion, but recently I've just been like more vocal about it. Like we've decided to talk about it more because it's like comes in with planning things for future, like getting married, like how we want to get married, how we want to raise our kids. So I just, He's just been with me for like seven years, and I do want to marry him. It just okay. I'm going to warn you that some of these conservative churches have very traditional family values, right? Which is Mm -hmm. code for he runs the house. Does does his family operate that way? Have you seen his family? His family kind of does, but he's not like that now. Like his dad. Yeah, he's not like that now, but you're not married and you don't have kids yet. Now, I don't want to frame somebody (laughs) wrongly, but you're basically saying that now that the marriage is coming up, these conversations are starting to become a thing where they were never a thing before. They were like kind of a thing, but we never really came to a conclusion before. Okay, This is important to him though, right? Yes. Like he says, it's his like Christian duty to like, spread this to his kids. Okay. Well, he's told you. (laughs) I mean, I don't know. There is no good answer to this other than go in with your eyes open Mm -hmm. because he is Mm -hmm. telling you how it's going to be. And Mm -hmm. I don't, uh, and if you have concerns and you want to go through with this, I guess the only helpful suggestion I can make is tell him you want to go to counseling pre-marriage. Tell them you want to go mm-hmm. see a counselor. Pick yourself a secular counselor that you feel good about and say, we need to make sure this is clear and ironed out and that we have a path going forward on this before we go to the altar. Mm-hmm. And that way yeah. you'll have a third party intervening to help you guys communicate this stuff and get whatever the concerns are out there. Um, but I, I don't think I would walk into this thing without something like that. Yeah, I understand that. One thing that I've told him, it's kind of like, not very nice, but it's kind of like a joke kind of for him because I don't want to raise our kids that way. I told him, if your God wants our kids to like practice God, then they will. But if he doesn't, then they won't. So it's kind of like what I've been telling him. Like if you pray hard enough, they might go to church or might believe that. He's going to bring them to church when they're little. Like before they have a chance to even know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And they're going to go into that church and they're going to play with other little kids and they're going to get to go put little sticky things on the felt board and they're going to sing songs and there's going to be vacation Bible school and the kids are going to love it. I guess you need to decide, John, if that's, uh, well, first of all, if that's what's going to happen. I think it's good that you're talking about that now. And I don't know, is, is, has he been open to these discussions? Is, it, it does, does he, is he interested in how you feel about how you want them raised? Uh, is he willing to negotiate? That's all stuff we don't know about him. Um, He's open. Like, I always, I like want to bring this up with him, but I know he doesn't really want to talk about it. So when you do bring it up, he's like, he knows how I feel and he knows what I want, but he still says like, no, I want to do this. That, that's to me is a red flag. That's an sure. impasse. I mean, that's an impasse. And, and I think it's fair to say 
if our plan is to get married and our plan is to have kids and we're disagreeing on something really foundational here that means a lot to both of mm-hmm. us, then we need to have somebody come and talk to us, right? Because, I mean, if he's flexible enough to say, let's go to a UU church instead of the church where my family goes, right? Like, let's go to a more yeah. liberal um, Christian church that isn't so preachy and indoctrinating that mo- mainly just has somebody that gets up and talks about, you know, good civic duty and what it's like to be, a you know, a, a good, decent person and to be yeah. kind to others and, and help. And where the kids learn about yeah. religion, not yeah. they don't learn which religion is the correct That's one. an option, but it has to be yeah. an option he would be okay with. I mean, I don't know how, if he's just likes that church thing, wants to bring the kids to the church and he would be okay with like a UU church. Um, or if he would, and that's um, Unitarian Universalists. Uh, that's a good. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's a good middle ground. A lot of mixed uh, mixed belief couples go end up there because they can kind of both yeah. be a community there. So if he's flexible in that level, you could say, okay, I don't mind the kids going to church. Can we go to a, a you know Universalist un, Unitarian Universalist church? And that way, the kids mm-hmm. get to they have that church experience. Somebody stands up and does a quote sermon that is really just about being a good person, right? Like or like John is saying, they'll talk about different religious traditions, and the kids can get an understanding of religion without being indoctrinated. Um, mm-hmm. And so, if he's flexible like that, if he's not demanding that you go to his family's church, um, that might be an, an option. Yeah. There's there's I, options. I don't want to be bleak, right? Because there are <laughs> mixed couples that do make things work. And like me and my husband had different ideas about it, but he wasn't that churchy, right? So it's like that's um, that's a different thing when the guy is saying, "I want to bring the kids to church with me." And so there might be some give and take available between the two of you, but I would definitely get somebody involved in this to help you talk through it. Yeah. Decide for okay, yourself, yeah, de- decide for yourself what a, uh, what's going to be a deal breaker and what he's willing to negotiate with you about and, and decide if, if whatever he wants and is not willing to negotiate on, is that okay with you if your kids do that? And if it's not, then yeah. you need to make other plans, I think. No, but he, I feel like he would be flexible to that because okay. he is pretty conservative religiously, but like other things, he's super liberal. He was very flexible at stuff, but okay. I feel like if he, we do want to go to a church like that, those just seem like morals that we could teach them at home. Like it doesn't have to be around a church, you know? Yeah, but if he likes that tradition, I'm just saying it's yeah. a nice way to get a secular religious education for the kids and a good, like you say, sort of moral framework of, you know, being a good citizen um, and being a good, you know, family member and being just a good person um, overall, the value of kindness, things like that. Um, that's mm-hmm. That church is a, is a good fit. Like John is saying, if you've got somebody that really just wants to do the church thing, if they're not tied to a specific tradition, um, that could be a flexible option that allows him to feel like he's getting that church thing and allows you to feel like your kids are not being indoctrinated into beliefs in hell and stuff. And you can do it together. Yeah. yeah. You're, he's not going to church with the kids and you're staying at yeah. home and, you know, doing your own thing. Yeah, it's enjoyable. I mean, I've been to a UU service and, you know, it's it's like going to a lecture. So it's actually pretty nice. Yeah. I didn't even know those were a thing, so yeah. thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Good. And, and, they're, and I know they're there's everywhere. some, and I know there's some in the Houston area. There's yeah. several. So yeah. there's a lot of them around. Mm-hmm. It's it's worth it's worth checking out anyway and see what he thinks about it. Yeah, that might be a good right. solution. All right, awesome. Well, thank y'all so much. I'm not going to take up <laughs> good luck with stuff. it. Call us I, back and let us know how it goes. Thank you. I okay. will update y'all. All right, thank, thank you. you Jonna. Okay, so now we're back. We're on to the the final call that was an original call. So this is one of the, the last original callers to the show. So this is Ram in New Delhi, and you want to talk about spirituality lacking in atheism. And you're on with Tracy and John. There's some background noise. Just giving you a heads up. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, am I audible? I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, that, that's much better. Okay, so uh, basically I wanted to talk about two things. One is duality and one is the biggest questions that are out there, the children's questions, like uh, why are we here, where life came from, 
what is consciousness what's the universe and why all of this i have recently been a atheist and uh, these questions they are uh, you know all of the answers to these questions are i don't know and uh, i am feeling that that is very dissatisfying to me because i am a very curious person i want to know things and uh, uh, yes so that that's where i'm coming from sure we all, we all would like to know the answers to questions it's it's kind of human nature i think to to be curious and to seek knowledge and to want answers to things and that's why we explore these things. Yeah, and it's kind of I'm the anomaly cuz cuz my answer wouldn't be I don't know, my answer would be I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I seriously okay. and now, I'm not trying to be dismissive of your curiosity. Let me just make that clear. Right, right, right. I understand that. You have this like, hey, I would like to have answers here, but sometimes you can ask a question in a way where it doesn't have an answer, right? So for example, if I asked you where does a flame go when you blow the candle out? What is the answer? No, I I get that. I get that. I I get it that some questions are like there is no where, there is no what, there is no why. Right. And and, and so when somebody when that. somebody says why am I here? Or like what is the meaning of what in the purpose of me actually existing? That assumes it, there is one. <laughs> it could be that that's a question that's the wrong question. That's a mute question. Well, it might not be even a reasonable question, right? It might yeah, be a yeah, question I, I that. that is like the wrong question to be asking. Um, and the other question... But it's, the, it's the way we are wired. Well, I think it's... I think personally, like my personal view on this, is that religion tends to pump these questions up as big questions because that helps sell religion. I think that most people on the planet go through their day-to-day -day life and never stop and ponder why they're here. I think that most people go through, uh, can go like an entire year without asking, where did the universe come from? I just don't mm -hmm. think that this is something that bugs people. I think that people ignore it and that churches basically say, these are the big questions that need answers. And it's like, really, they're, they're not questions. They don't have answers. And most people aren't really bothered by not knowing or thinking about it. Because they're selling the answers is what right. they want you to. Now, there are people that do explore, right? Like John is saying, you've got some people who are like, I'm going to take a ship to and circumnavigate the globe just because, right? And there's like that person. Um, and I'm not going to say that there, that there isn't that person. And I'm not going to say that even though they might be in a minority in my view, right? Like I say earlier, like I'm the minority, but I don't think I am. I think most people aren't asking these questions or even bothered by them. And I think that though, if somebody has these questions, first of all, make sure you're right. You're asking questions that actually have answers, right? That ca that do have an answer. And so, a question instead of saying "Why am I here?" maybe saying "I'm here and I exist." And so, what do I do with this? What do I do with with what I have here? Mm. How do I proceed? What is my obligation to other people? Well, and, I, and I think those are questions that are more important to people that they do think about on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So I'll do something and I'll think, oh, do I have to call so-and-so and tell them that I changed that plan, that we're, you know, dinner got moved and I have to, you know, do this or that with the... Our obligations to other people really do um, consume much more of our day-to-day -day lives than why am I here? I would say I am here, so what, what are my goals? What are my obligations? What are my values? What drives my existence? Not why right. is there an right. existence. Right, but, but uh, let me tell you something. Sure. Ever since I was, I, I could, you know, perceive of things, ever since I could understand and reason, I have been asking the question, like these questions, these are my questions. Like these are my biggest questions. I it, it was not promoted by a church. It was not promoted by you know. It, it, I didn't. Uh, I I did. I was not like indoctrinated. No, that's fair. And and I accept. Questions. I accept what you're saying. I, I think that's fair. And if you say this has driven you, I believe it. But I still think it, that you have to think in terms of asking reasonable questions, right? Because. When you ask the question, where does the flame go when you blow the candle out, the, there is no answer to that because the flame doesn't go somewhere. 
right? The, the flame extinguishes and there's no more flame. It didn't go and, and run away somewhere else. And so the way that question is phrased, there is no answer because it's a nonsensical question. And I think that if there's not a creator, right, like let's just for the sake of argument say there, there's no creator, then asking why do I exist, why am I, what is the reason I am here for is, is a nonsensical question. It would be... And what, I, if, what if that causes you extreme distress? Then I would say that you need to understand why the question is a nonsensical question. Ask the right question. Ask okay. a question that actually can have an answer. Because what you're saying is, what if I really need to know where the flame goes? I don't know what to tell you because the flame doesn't go anywhere. The question is, what happens to the flame when you blow the candle out? Not where did it go? And I'm saying, mm -hmm. ask a question that makes sense and you'll have an easier time finding an answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you're still un and if you're still under distress, the really all you can do is try to come come to terms with that and realize that I don't know is still going to be I don't know whether you're stressed about it or not. Yeah. And and it's not you know and I don't I'm I hope I don't sound dismissive of your of your angst about this right like I, I don't mm -hmm. mean to. Um, and but yeah. I do I do think that if you kind of question your questions, you, okay. you might be able to to formulate better questions that maybe do have answers that you can pursue. That's sort of my right. recommendation. Yeah. Reframe. Yeah, that, that that that's something I could do. Okay. okay. I hope it helps. Yeah. Thank. You. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I Thanks, appreciate Ron. your call. Okay, so that clears the the uh, the initial first, the batch of wave. callers. So now we'll just head on down, right? So we have um, Ed in Ohio who wants to talk about um, the times that we misquote the Bible on the show. So hey, Ed, you're on with Tracy and John. Hey, how you guys doing? Okay. Good. Hi, Ed. I'm John. Hey, well, I was initially calling for John. Uh, oh, he's here. Uh, you met me on uh, Dr. Kent Hovind's channel. Uh, you told me to call in, you know. So uh, here I am. I don't but, think uh, I don't think that was me, but go ahead. <laughs> but uh, apparently, I want to talk to Tracy right now at the moment. Sure. Since she's going to be gone for a couple weeks. Um, He's confusing with me. This uh, fire in the candle thing you me you mentioned just a second ago. You sure. Said you don't know where it goes. Right. Yeah. Well, that would involve science, I believe. No, it doesn't go yeah. anywhere. The flame goes nowhere. There is no well, more flame. Well, well, the candle extinguishes. What's the flame made out of? The flame is excited atoms. Out of what? What do you mean out of what? See, there's different components for a flame. You need oxygen and, you know, carbon monoxide. Well, that's fuel. Like that. so that it uses components. fuel. But what you're seeing with a flame is excited atoms. And not necessarily. That's what's glowing. But, but the point is it doesn't go anywhere. When you state. blow out the candle, it doesn't go anywhere. It's not like the flame is now in a different location. It's a nonsensical question. It's actually called a cone. Well, no, because where this is going is with that other gentleman's question when he called is where's our existence go to? Now, our body... He didn't say that. <laughs> he that's said, that's he that's said that's what that's is that's the that's meaning of... Well, he's asking what is the meaning of his life and where did he come from? Yeah, and then what happens after? And then what happens after is you go to heaven. See, I'm a Christian. I right, that's Bible what you believe. That's, that's what you believe. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's what I believe. We Demonstrate don't. it. Right. And the, the Bible has never been proven wrong. The Bible what? Has never been proven wrong to this day. It also hasn't been proven right. Why do you believe it? Uh, well, first off, all the prophecies that have come true. What prophecy? Oh, and then, what prophecy? Um, the plagues, the earthquakes. What uh, plague prophecy are you talking about? Um, if you look in Revelations and in Daniel, uh, King David, you'll see... Uh, yeah, Revelation has like a million different uh, interpretations depending on who you ask. So that book uh, is just no, a, is a big pile of crazy. And excuse me for the, no. for the um, ableist slur. Um, but yeah, it, th that book is, is uh, just a, a bunch of different wild images from Old Testament books like mashed together. So do you understand it at all? Have Nobody does. No one does. That's well, why there's like a million different interpretations of it. 
I understand. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I know you think you understand it. You have an interpretation of it. Other people have other interpretations of it. Why should I believe yours? Well, if you don't understand what words mean, then you're not going to understand interpretation. I'm not talking about what words mean. What you're basically saying is other Christians are all wrong, and you're right. And I'm saying why? Why do you believe that? Because I'm following God's word. Right, but so are they. If they tell you they're following God's word and they have a different interpretation, do you believe them? Well, they're obviously lying because if you check this Okay, so maybe you're obviously lying. Why should I believe you? You're telling me the same thing they would say to you. Catholics say the same thing, and they obviously do the the exact opposite of what the Bible claims to do. No, they they are doing the exact opposite of what you're saying the Bible claims to do. They say it claims to do something else, and I'm saying that book is a mess, and why should I believe Uh you over somebody else who, but when both of you are saying, I've got the right interpretation? Because the Catholics both go off the King James Version, and if you read the King James Version of the Bible... Why would you you believe the King James? There are better, there are better... um, Source documents out there. Why would you believe one that's based on inferior documents? Uh, can you name some? Because they're both came from the Jewish and Greek mythology. So they're all broken down from the same place. I don't even know what that means. What do you mean it came from Greek mythology? <laughs> you know, with the pagan religions, that's how they try to throw it in their Christianity. You know, it all comes in the same place. I mean, obviously you would know that. Your Bible came from oh, Greek think- mythology? Like, where are you getting this? My Bible did not come from Greek mythology. What came from Greek mythology is what they're placing Christianity off of today. So these Christians, like the Catholic Church, that you came, that you say claim come from the Bible, do not say what the Bible claims, do they? They built your Bible, dude. The Catholic no, Church they... gave you the Bible. You took it and made like a Protestant version of what they produced. Yeah, man. I mean, they worked the the original Roman Catholic Church that was promoted by Rome, which is why it's called the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Universal Church, are the ones who started this whole let's make a Bible thing. If you're using it and then maligning the Catholics, that makes no sense at all. Is that why they changed it over and over and over? The one you've got is got footnotes and and side notes, margin notes in it that are showing all the the differences in the books and how they don't align. You've got those notes in your own Bible, saying that this doesn't match this other book. Explain explain to me how prophecy that was over two thousand years old has come true about people having to put marks and chips in their hands in order to buy, sell, and trade. Can you explain that to me? People have chips in their hands to buy, sell, and trade. Yes, they do. And this was prophesied in the Bible? Yes. Have you read Revelations? Yeah, and I don't remember it saying anything. Chips in their hands? He's talking about (laughs) like everybody had to be marked, and he's taking that to mean this. And this is what I'm saying. You have your own interpretation of it that you believe, and it is different than what other people believe, and neither of you has any claim of validity in how you're interpreting this thing at all. In fact, there are some people who believe that everything in Revelation happened a long time ago. Well, then obviously, then obviously I don't know how they could believe that when nobody took marks in their hands a long time ago. Check this out then. Okay, so then if it doesn't happen, talk on the Bible says every man rich or, rich or poor. Why are we talking about the Bible? Because first of all, let me just say, let's say that ev- that the Bible has magnificent prophecies in it, right? That does not demonstrate a God exists. So why are we talking about this? Well, this is God's word. His prophecy. no, that's your claim. But how? Do, even if even if even if we had really amazing prophecies in that book, how do you know it's because of a God? Well, obviously, they're Jesus' words, so there you go. No, not there you go. What? Not there you go. If prophecies occur, and let's say Jesus believed that prophecies occur, how do you know that he even knows that that was because of a God? Just because he believes it doesn't make it true. Jesus is the son of God. That's what you're saying. That's your belief. Are you are you serious? Are you trolling? Is there like some challenge? <laughs> Did someone put you up to see how long you could stay on the on the show, like on a call? Seriously, is this a serious call? This is dead serious because I hear the things you tell these people and it's lies. No, you're simply saying that it doesn't agree with your belief and then you're saying it's a lie even though other Christians also say you're wrong. I mean, this is no, what's no. absurd. You don't have the fucking market on Christian uh, interpretations. Seriously, dude, there's other people that are other Christians who believe different things about what you're claiming you know. And those people have just as much right to make those claims as you do. And they are just as valid as the claim you're making, which is not at all. 
listen, you're the one that's telling everybody it's okay they can be transgender. That's a mental illness. Okay, oh, there goes. It was a troll. So, yeah, it was, a, it was a troll challenge. It wasn't a serious call. And thank you for wasting our time. Um, you know, whatever. We have sincere callers who would like to get on the show. Yeah, you got your dig in. Um, I'm glad that whatever it was in the last week or so got up your ass that bad that you felt like that was necessary just so you could call in and be a trans bigot and make a joke about it. Thanks. You know, not thanks. Fuck you. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Fuck you. So let's go with number five. This is Mike in Fremont, California. What would be more likely, a god or a fairy tale? And you're on with Tracy and John. Hi, Mike. Now, is that a question for us, I guess? What, what, which fairy tale? Hello? Mike in Fremont, California, can you hear us? Yeah, oh, sorry. Oh. I had you guys on mute. <laughs> okay. There you are. So what, which fairy tale are we talking about? Uh, which is, you know, any, any fairy tale, fairy, Tinkerbell, okay. a fairy. Do you, you know, do you, when you hear, God. when you hear the story of Zeus, do you consider that a fairy tale or do you consider that a likely God? I consider the story of Zeus a mythology. That's, I think, the correct categorization for that. I think that's kind of the, the general consensus. Okay, so what are you defining as a fairy tale? Uh, I guess a fairy tale would be... Uh, Peter Pan or Santa Claus or um, okay. So with with show? Santa Claus, Bears. okay. So with Santa Claus, what we've got is a story that says that if you believe and are a good person, you'll be rewarded. And you're asking me if I think that that's more likely than the religious story that if you believe and you're a good person, <laughs> you'll get rewarded. Is that right? That's that's generally the idea. Yeah. yeah. They seem pretty similar to me. So, so they're equal, equally likely. So, true, true. Seems yeah. that once you start going off on stories, like when I start hearing about the talking serpent and the talking donkey and the woman oh. who's 100 years old who had a baby, I have to say that I'm in the fairy tale market, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to have to throw you a bone here because uh, I, I'm not really talking about the story of Christianity. I'm talking about the... the existence of God, okay, right? Okay, but that story kind of like is tied to the existence of a God, and I just told you another sure. story that's tied to the existence of a God, and you said, well, that's a mythology. So which God seems likely? Well, uh, mythology isn't a fairy tale. I, 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 I'm okay with you designating it that, but I also assume that what you're saying is that, I mean, do you think that mythologies are true in the sense of mapping to reality? Well, by definition, are things that we don't really know if they're true or not. They were regarded as true once in a time. Well, no, I can actually invent... I mean, time. Lord of the Rings is a mythology, and I'm pretty sure that we can say it's not true. It was invented Incorrect. as a fantasy Lord literature. Lord of the Rings is a work of fiction and yeah. would be categorized under fairy tale. No, it's a so, mythology. So versus, do you think that it's... Possible? Wait a minute. It, to, Tolkien himself said sure. that he was creating an alternative mythology here for, for the European continent. He he said that. I don't see he the point of it. making a distinction there. Yeah, I guess I'm arguing are you, are you pedantic. Are you so yeah. Like the Hobbit. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying that he was making a mythology. I'm talking about Lord of the Rings. But the point is, like, I agree, I have to agree with John just for the sake of moving the conversation along. No, I don't think I don't think it's any more likely that a god exists than a fairy. Well, that's that's kind of interesting because then you then I'd have to ask you, why don't you know fairies aren't real? Who says I don't? Who says that I don't accept that they're not real? That's 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 like, no. It's like it, everybody knows they're not real. Why don't you, everybody knows Santa Claus is not real? Everybody knows Darth Vader is not real. Everybody knows Lord of the Rings is not real. Yeah. So why, why do you believe in God when there's no more evidence for that than any of the things you just listed? That's the question I don't get, is how people who understand that all of these things don't have evidence to support them, and so therefore it would be ridiculous to believe in them, then go on to believe in something that has no evidence no, to support no, it. No. We, yes, we yes. The reason, like, remember the previous caller who asked about ever since he was able to perceive things, he would ask himself, where did everything come from? Yep, I remember um, that, that caller. that is the nature of believing in God. It doesn't come from... He didn't say um, he believed in God ever since he was... Let me just point out to you that that caller 
um, was not that, listed as a theist. The evidence, that caller was not the a theist. Is, is, hold on. Hold matter. on. It doesn't matter. Okay, You're I'm on putting hold. you on hold. The caller who said he was asking those deep questions was screened as an atheist. And I want to make sure everyone's aware of that because what he's basically saying is, you know, and this is about belief in God. And what I'm saying is this is a caller who was saying, I have these deep questions that, that plague me, but I don't believe in a God exists. So you're back on, and I just wanted to make the point for the audience that the caller who was asking those questions was not a theist. Okay, that's, that's, that's fine. But he still said something that was true in his heart, which was that everybody, you know, ever since we're able to perceive things, ever since I saw the first tree in my life, you know, ever since I, I was able to remember, I'm getting ready for you to I dismiss me as, as a person here, so Thanks. go for it. Because you're about to say that I lied. So, no, so tread no, lightly. I I yeah. was, what I was about to say is that, you, you know, we have evidence for God because the universe itself exists and we find ourselves here with a conscious mind and that... You, we so what? How does that How prove that there's a God? God? For Darth Vader because they're fairy tales. They're How is the characters. fact that... You can't just say, I exist, therefore God. That, that kind of is the, the nature of... of yeah, the, that is a ridiculous a argument. argument. I exist, therefore God. Seriously, I, how about if I say I exist, therefore no God? I exist, therefore Zeus. I exist, therefore well, Santa no. Claus. You could, you, you could, that's exactly why I'm, I'm asking you. Why, do you. why don't you recognize that Zeus and Santa Claus are not real? There's, there's I no do. Thing. Why don't you recognize they're not real? I I do. But you exist? How can Santa not be real if you exist? You're the one who told me that you entertain the possibility that they might actually exist. I'm telling you that they when don't. When did I say that? For a fact. You, you said that, you know, that you don't really know. You consider the... Or are you saying that you do know for a fact that God does not exist? I'm saying I have actually said before, and I will say it again, that to the extent that anybody should be able to say that fairies do not exist, they should be able to say there is that a God does not exist. If you can't make those two so, statements... So you know God does not exist, you know it. I'm saying that to the extent that a person can say that fairies do not exist, they should be able to say that a God exists. does not exist. Right? You don't have evidence, neither do I. I right. Don't know. You don't know. But where there is Wait, no, where, where, where all, there should be, wow, where there should be evidence and there is no evidence, that is evidenced against something. Do you understand so, that? So you're, saying that you, you, so you're saying that you don't know if God exists and you also don't know if fairies exist or not. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that to the extent that I can say that I'm confident fairies don't exist, I feel that same confidence about the non-existence of a God. And the reason for it is the same, that where the evidence should be, it isn't. Do you know if God exists or not? Do where is your you evidence that there is a God beyond just you exist? So do you know that God does not exist? Oh my God, I'm done with this. Okay, we're moving on to number six. This is sad in Pakistan. A God is the only thing that can explain the world that we live in, and you're on with Tracy and John. So go go for it. Did I pronounce your name right? Saad? You pronounced my name right. We spoke before. Okay, I thought uh, so. Okay, good. Yeah, so uh, basically uh, just wanted to uh, give a shout-out to all the Muslims uh, listening to this. Uh, Ramadan, happy Ramadan. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm going to allow a holiday shout-out. I think that's a... You know, happy Ramadan yeah. to you. Yeah, enjoy your holiday. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, it's uh, not really a holiday, but anyway. Uh, so, yeah, well, in my in my opinion, I think uh, because, you know, I've I've had discussions with my friends about this. I myself, uh, as we speak, I'm trying to figure out a lot of mysteries of the universe that I feel are still unresolved. Obviously, the big question, the big question everyone discusses here is God. And uh, so my opinion on this is like in a recent discussion with a friend, so I asked him, so what do you think would be a good reason for the existence of God? And he, according to him, I kind of agreed with him too. He said, well, if you look at the world around you, the way it's made perfectly, and if you look at the ceiling uh, on top of you, you'll see there's imperfections and it's man-made. And the way the world is, how, how the sky is held without pillars, you know, it's, it's a reference. Uh, it's sort of a, 
reference from the Quran too. I'm correct, uh, I could, I'm not I'm not exactly quoting it correctly, so I don't want to misquote the source. But it's kind of sort of similar uh, quotation that I've uh, read. So it's 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 basically my way of saying that there, there's the way the world is made so perfectly. It's it's there, it's very possible. It can't be possible that anyone other than a God could make it. I mean, what would be your opinion on it? Who else could have done it other than a supernatural being? Why do you assume that it had to be done by a who? Well, then who? Then what would be your opinion? That's the big. That's the big mystery. The like, question would be what to, caused the universe, not who caused the universe, right? Because we, it, we'd have to we'd have to, to know be. that there was a who that caused it before we could even get to the point where we're asking, okay, so who was it? What we're saying is the question should be asked: what What's the cause of the universe? Yeah, I mean, if you remember my last call, we tried to get that common ground thing. Uh, we talked yeah, yeah. about the common ground. Yeah, I took yeah, heat yeah. for that, so, by the way. It's funny. People got upset with me for that, but I don't care. <laughs> so sorry for that. That's okay. <laughs> I enjoyed it. So, uh, well, the thing is, like, in my, uh, uh, just going going forward with this, I, I just think that, you know, I, I mean, there's, we talk, there's there's the Big Bang Theory that, uh, that, that, that's been... Uh, normally uh, accepted as, okay, this is why how the world was created, but then who caused the Big Bang Theory? It has to be something that makes the world so perfect that even men can't, that, that, that even, uh, even us... Okay, so are, wait, 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 just a minute, thing. just a minute. When you say the world is perfect, I mean, you understand that there are some horrors that go on on this planet, right? Even horrors that human beings have nothing to do with. That this, this planet, if, if, if this is perfect... I would hate to see what flawed looks like, right? In the Christian tradition, they actually insert a part to their mythology that says, and then the world got messed up, right? So God made a perfect world and then people came and, and sin messed it up. And the reason they insert that is because there has to be some explanation for some of the horrifying things that occur, not just at the hands of humans, but sometimes natural disasters or animals attacking each other or attacking people or diseases that plague, you know, people and other species. And there's like a lot of things on the planet that are pretty horrible sometimes. It doesn't rain and then populations starve to death. I'm not sure that I agree that this is perfection. Yeah, that's a valid point. Uh, you know, the interesting thing, one of my agnostic friends said that to me too. When I asked him that question, I was like, that's a good point. So, uh, yeah, I don't really have a good answer for this, to be honest with you. Right, but if the question is only, if, if the idea is that only a supernatural, you know, perfect being could create such a perfect world, does the fact that the world's not perfect play to that at all for you? Well, now that you mentioned that there, uh, yeah, these natural disasters obviously make it seem un imperfect. But I mean, in terms of in terms of design, in the sense like well, the way things are for the most part, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, what else could have? How it, it couldn't just ha come out of nowhere. Well, know? here's the thing, I mean, right? This any... this is a this is actually, and I'm not trying to, uh, what do you call it? Like. Um, I, I don't. I, I just want to say that this is a question for. Uh, cosmologists, right? So for astrophysicists who study the origins of the universe, if a person says, I really want to understand this, it is some heavy science, right? I mean, this is some heavy science. Now, there are some people who have taken the time to put it in lay terms for the population to look at and read, right? So there's a, there's a um, Hawking essay that's called something like The Beginning of Time, and that's sort of a nice user-friendly, layman-friendly explanation of his understanding of what you know, he thinks about the origins of the universe. And if a person is curious about that, they could go and look at that. If you're like super ready to do the work and really knuckle down, you could start learning the science if you don't already know it. I would struggle, I think, with physics. Um, but if you're the type of person who thinks that you might have an aptitude and you might be able to understand some of this stuff, I would say feel free to delve into some of the deeper dives that are available out there because they do publish research on this. So there, it's not that there's no, um, there's no study and discovery around this question, but the discovery and the study around it so far has been about just sort of what is the cause and not necessarily a who. Now, that doesn't mean that one day they won't find a who. It just means that right now that's not really on the radar. But if you're but if you're curious about it, there are people who make that their whole, you know, realm of research. Yeah. 
Does that make sense? And, and the thing is, like, it does make sense. And what I'm go- what I want to say is that if you go to any holy book, whether it's the Quran or the Bible, obviously they'll make the claim that God made it. But then, obviously, as a Muslim, I'm I'm supposed to believe that you know the word. Uh, the what that that what's in the Quran is true, and I and and I do believe that. So obviously, by giving you that explanation, that okay, there is all these passages in the Quran that state that the world was made this way, and you know, it, it there's passages that sort of, you know, uh, that you know do kind of uh, if if it interpreted in a certain way could make uh, could say that it, it, it's it's talking about the Big Bang theory, or maybe it's not. No, I understand but, what you're uh, saying. I mean, to be honest, right? So I've seen a few videos that were put out by Muslim apologists who were talking about some of these ideas about how the Earth was formed. And one of them actually was interesting because it talked about a meteor hitting the Earth and like driving into the center of the Earth and becoming the Earth's iron core. And in fact, that's not the theory. And so what was interesting was here was this person that put together a video saying, and the Quran tells us this, and so it's really amazing because this is what the science says, but when you look up the science, it doesn't say that. So then there's other people who will say, oh, and here's what the Quran says, and this is what the science says, and yeah, that is what the science says. And so it seems like people can kind of put their own spin on what it is the Quran is saying and kind of get it to craft to whatever they understand the science to be saying. Perhaps, yes, perhaps you're right. I mean, it's just something to look into because there's I've seen different explanations from people saying, and it says this, and this is the science, and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. So I don't know. It seems to me like it might be flexible. It could be. It could be. That's something I definitely, uh, a more knowledgeable expert would know, you know. Exactly. I, I really I really don't have the answer to that question myself. Okay. Either I go by what, what, what it said or either I don't. Okay. Well, was that the question? I mean, did we, did we get, at least get through the question? Yeah, for the most part. It was very interesting. Okay. It was very eye-opening, actually. <laughs> well, thank you, Seth. I appreciate you calling. Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, thanks for having me on the, on the show. Yeah, appreciate I appreciate it. it. Bye. Yeah, and I just want to, you know, plug myself here for a second for all those people that got upset with me um, for, you know, they said I was softball and sad. And my response was, you want the person to call back. And this was a guy who was willing to have an honest conversation to think about what I was saying, to admit when maybe there was a good point made. And this is the type of caller I want to call again, right? Because this is a guy who's thinking about it and willing to think about it. And, you know, he's, he's talking, and this is what we want, is people to talk. So we have one final call going on here. We'll go ahead and take it. This is still probably as close to six as I've ever gotten, maybe. And um, this is Don in California who says you're going through, oh, chemo, and would like to talk about determinism and logic. Um, yeah, that's, I, yeah, interesting. So go ahead, Don. You're on with Tracy. Hi, Tracy. Hey, uh, John. Uh, hey, thanks for uh, taking my call. Which I'm a fan of the show now for uh, maybe three, four years. Uh, yeah, going through some uh, a rough time. I've been fighting cancer for seven years, and uh, wow. we're getting kind of kind of thin on the options I've gone through. Uh, one stem cell transplant already; uh, it, uh, it's not effective. So we're looking to do a second stem cell transplant this time with a donor. Um, uh, that said, I just had a horrendous uh, reaction to uh, chemo when the anaphylactic shock and uh, nearly died. Holy cow, Don! I'm, I'm really I'm sorry to hear this. Just FYI, I mean, I had my husband went through cancer when I was married, and I just spoke with somebody right before the show who's going through chemo as well. And so, um, this is personal for me, and I'm sorry to hear this story, and I'm sorry it's gone on so long, and that you're having to deal with other complications is just awful. And I'm so sorry. Well, if cancer's not bad enough, try fighting the insurance system. <laughs> that doesn't help <laughs> that's either. That's another long issue. Yeah. That's yeah. another issue altogether. You. But uh, the reason I, one of the reasons I call, call in, um, I was kind of curious, uh, you, you can't really speak to this in the way that uh, Matt was um, on the last show. You can't speak for Matt, that is. Right. But uh, they were talking about determinism and not having free will that you know, has, uh, all the molecules have been set in a certain motion since the Big Bang uh, is kind of what I, I gather from it. And this is kind of 
determine your set of circumstances, which I, I can kind of understand, uh, and it will set you into a, you know, a course, apparently, that you really can't change much. And I, I thought that to be a kind of curious position. Uh, I, as far as I'm concerned, I can, I can decide to turn left, turn right, go to college, assuming you have the funds to do so, and so forth. Um, so I kind of, what do they, I'm confused. What do they mean that we really don't have free will? Okay, so this gets into an issue where, okay, so first of all, I agree with you that we are agents. I have agency, right? right. Like I have desires. I right. weigh options. I know that internally in my head there are dialogues about what I should do and that I spend time thinking about decisions before I make them. The question becomes, is that agency ultimately malleable, right? So I do right. have, in the sense of, is anybody impeding my will, right? Like, so there's free will in the sense of, I am not locked in this studio. So if I want to, I could just hang up this phone right now and I can walk out of the studio, get in my car and go home, right? I mean, there's nothing stopping me. No one's, going, no one's chained me to this table. So I, you know, under certain, no other agent is compelling me to do anything right now that I am like forced to do. So what I'm doing, having this conversation with you sitting at this table is done of my free will right? That is my agency has agreed to this. I have consented to this and I am doing this. This is really the free will that matters, right? It's not about right. could I do something different? I really don't care if I could do something different. This is what I want to do. This is what I've committed to do. This is what I'm doing. And my agency, regardless of whether I can change it or not, and regardless of what inputs go into making me have the desires that I have, they're still my desires, and I'm still pursuing them in the way that I want to pursue them. And in that regard, I am free. Nobody's stopping me, right? No one's coming in here, locking me in a jail cell, beating me, like forcing me to eat something. Um, no one's forcing me to take a drink of water right now. Right. I'm doing it because I, because I want to. The question of whether, of why I want to, do I want to because this was determined at the outset of the universe? Or do I want to because I actually could do something different? I really don't give a shit right? It doesn't matter. Right. The point is I'm doing what I want to do or I'm not doing what I want to do when someone, when another agent comes in and imposes on me, which totally can happen. And sure. that's the dialogue that matters. Now, there are some people who want to sit around and think like, could I have not had that drink of water? Could I, I don't care. I mean, those yeah. people need to go and sit at a table at dinner or happy hour or whatever and have that conversation for six hours Good luck and have fun. You know, it doesn't matter to me. Of course. Of course. Right. But All that's right. what they're course, talking right. about. Those are, those are the two right. divergent views and what those two people are, or those two groups are talking about. So one of them is talking about whether or not you could actually alter the future. The other one is saying, are you pursuing what you want or is another agent coercing you to do something differently? To me, that's the, the part that matters. I don't care why I want to do it. I just want to do it. And, it, and I either can right. or I can't. Right. You know, from my position, we all have a, you know, agency. And to the extent that our environment that we find ourselves in will allow, you know, we have the ability to change the course of our future. Well, what, they're, what they would be saying is that, though, you're I, not, they're saying, they would say that your agency is certainly involved in what happens but that you don't ultimately have options with your agency in the way that you think you do. I'm saying, I don't know why that matters, <laughs> but, yeah, I, I'm with, but, I'm with you there. but I, at the same time, it's like if somebody told me the things, the, the agency that you have and the desires that you have and the things that bring you joy in life were determined at the beginning of the universe, I'd be like, so? I still enjoy them. I still value them, right? It doesn't matter if it was determined at the beginning of the universe or if I just made it up just now. It's still what I want. That doesn't change. Got it's it. still right. what I value. Yeah. yeah it's it late in my degree program, a biological science major. I, I was a former law enforcement, uh, lost my left eye in a domestic accident, took me out of the Marine Corps and out of law enforcement and sent me in a whole new direction. 
uh, which, you know, turned out to be just fine. I uh, became a biologist, and I work for a research hospital at the University of Davis Medical Center and uh, their poor lab. And uh, I thought I'd throw this out real quick, that as far as I understand, and maybe I, I don't know everything, which you research or have researched, but we've never done much research uh, in terms of spirituality. You know, if, if religion religions are on the right track, that we possess a spirit that is bonded in some fashion to our, to our bodies, this is the, the essence of life. Um, apparently, this escaped us there at the university. Um, as far as I know, we have not done much research in that direction. Uh, yeah, we're, our research is focused on uh, uh, innovative you know, cancer research, uh, it, a lot of different things. We search diet, you know, uh, dietary uh, outcomes and, and so forth. Sure. So, you know, I, I would think if there's such a thing as a spirit, whatever that might be, might consist of, you would think hospitals would be very excited about doing that research and finding ways to keep it in your body if that's what sustains life. Right. And as far as I know, we haven't done research of that nature. Uh, anyway, that said, uh, late my my college career, I took a course in logic, and uh, the, the instructor kind of got hung up around this idea of a Punnett square in which if the premises were all true, then the conclusion must therefore be true. And I can think of a lot of uh, instances in science where, yes, our premises were correct, but the conclusion we were, we were, we were reaching was not. So we kind of went around and around on, on that issue. It would have been great. I, I wish I could have caught you know, Stephen Pinker when yeah, I've had that. I've had that same um, conversation with people, right? So, uh, because we agree that a premise is true, doesn't mean that we're right, <laughs> all right? But I think the the what you were talking about, as far as the rule, it's assuming that you're right that the premise is actually true. Um, I don't know if there's something in there about you know that you have to have full disclosure because if you're missing something key, like if there's information you don't have, you could have like a line of true things that would ultimately lead to a particular conclusion that you're missing a piece, then you don't know it, and That's that changes argument. it. How do you know um, you have Now, the that could be accounted for somewhere in those rules. I don't know. I, I'm not that well-versed in it, but um, from a science standpoint, yes, science is, is counterintuitive many times, right? So there's a lot of times when we think we're going to get a particular result, and surprise, we get a different result. And we... Th- thought we had a pretty good idea of how to predict it going in, but this is why we verify crap, right? This is why it's important to not just say, this is how it seems to me because, you know, here's my apologetic argument. If this and if this and if this, then therefore God. And my question is, okay, so intuitively you feel like these things are true and this necessitates a God. How are you planning to check that it is that intuitive versus not intuitive? Because if you run the test and you get a different result, you're going to have to come up with a new idea. Right, I mean. Right, I, I found myself explaining, you know, the differences between a hypothesis, uh, and a theory, and why we use that term theory. You know, it in fact is malleable. You know, when genetics came along, Darwin could have been proved incorrect, but no, it further supported. Um, in fact, it gave substance to the whole notion of evolution. Now we know how evolution works. Those mechanisms in genetics, and Darwin could not have known. Um, so it was bizarre, but well, I think this, this instructor was more of an English background major and, yeah. uh, ended up I, I, you know, I, I need to be honest. I, I'm not the person, I'm not like the best person to be defending determinism and logic. So for people who are just like, oh, I'm so frustrated yeah. with what Tracy is saying, you know, apologies, right? I'm, I'm at least going <laughs> to admit that I'm probably not the person to cover this. So you get at least that. Um, sure. I'm, I'm just sort of telling you that my <laughs> limited understanding of it is, you know, sort of, I have sort of the same concerns. Um, I don't think it's a problem though with logic and how logic works. I think it's just a problem with knowledge, um, and capacity to know or to vet. But I do think that whatever a person, when a person comes up with an argument or a person comes up with a hypothesis or whatever it is that makes them think intuitively, this must be true. If the next step is not, now how do I test it, then what they've just argued is useless. 
It's right. useless, right? It doesn't help anybody because unless you can figure it out, um, it doesn't help you. Right. I would argue I'm, I'm an atheist. I'm still, I got one foot in the grave and the other one's in the banana peel. But I haven't seen anything yet that would lead me to conclude there is some sort of life at your definite existence beyond this or there's a, a deity that has their best interest in mind. Uh, the, the, perhaps the, the only thing I, I might subscribe to is the notion of, uh, oh, I say this uh, tongue in cheek, but, uh, uh, well, the term keeps my mind at the moment. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Anyway, a life, a life before this life, and that, you know. Like reincarnation or something? Reincarnation, thank you. Wow. Hey, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> it's more too much female. Um, okay. So anyway, right, reincarnation. And, uh, so I, I must have been a serial killer or something in a prior life. But man, have I ever... Oh, man. <laughs> I, I don't want to go to the details of what a transplant yeah. is like. And now I'm facing one that's even more challenging than the first. I'm looking at radiation that's going to cause... If we can even do it. Uh, you feel like every crying glance uh, in the cervical uh, area, throat. And uh, the... We're going to have to install a uh, feeding tube for this area to make it slow up to the point that I'm able to eat and so forth. Do you so, have support uh, through this? Like, are there people there for you, or do you have any kind of support? Um, I've got an awesome wife, to tell okay. you. Uh, okay. Without her, I probably would have died by now. Uh, she's been fantastic. I've got uh, a lot of colleagues at work that have been fantastic. They've donated thousands of dollars. Wow. Uh, which is has been more beneficial than any prayers, as far as I can tell. Okay. Uh, I I I have a colleague that also suffered from cancer. Before I went out on this leave of absence that I'm currently on, I raised uh, money for him. I kept imploring you know my staff that please, you know, prayers are wonderful, mm -hmm. but you know insurance falls short. Believe me, I mean, yeah. I have the finest medical insurance in the world. But that, I'm talking. I'm sure I'm talking to the choir. You know what? No, absolutely. I mean, yeah, and and it's it's painful. Yeah. Yes, and so uh, we have a really good staff, and we've raised a lot of money for each other when we're down. So, you know, uh, I like to give a shout out to those guys that I work with. They have been awesome, uh, wonderful staff. Uh, I kind of part of the saying that uh, religion uh, tends to seek through. Without, or I, I should say, science seeks proof without certainty. We may have to modify our position as more evidence uh, is collected. However, on the converse side, religion seeks certainty without proof. And, you know, they're kind of borrowing every time science makes a, a, a new discovery, trying to make that fit to their religious dogma. Uh, and that, you know, religion. Uh, I see it kind of like alcohol. It tends to cloud your mind. It can impair your judgment. And at times, it can make us talk pretty funny. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I can maintain a sense of humor through this. Uh, I, I served in the Marines. And uh, the one thing I'll take away from the Marines uh, is that no matter how bad the situation gets, don't worry. It can get worse. And even if it does, you, you know, maintain a positive uh, mindset, uh, you'll make it. And even if I don't survive this, um, I'm hoping that we learn something through this process. They, they, they kept me alive for seven years. This condition I've got would have killed you outright 25 years ago. Right. And so, you know, uh, I'm a guinea pig. And, uh, you know, it, that's okay. A lot of people died before me that has allowed me to live this far. Absolutely. So, with them, I'm thankful. You know, I'm sorry that they suffered. I'm sorry that they didn't make it. Yeah. But it's allowed us to, you know, give life or extend life when there would have been no hope. Yeah. Past. In my own situation with my ex, he actually had um, the standard treatment protocols failed. And so we ended up in a research right. trial. And the person I spoke to before the show is also right. in a research trial. And I think there's a huge amount of value um, in doing those things. And like you said, I personally, and I'm not comparing this to cancer, but I have like a thyroid condition that 
Um, basically, what they told me is they had to irradiate my thyroid, right? Which is a little bit scary thing because wow. then you can't survive anymore and you have to be on medication forever. And so, right. at, but but the like you're saying, years ago they would go in and do surgery, which they did on my mother, and they ended up cutting through like part of her vocal cords and paralyzing part of her vocal cords, and then. There was a situation with my her mother, and she died very young, um, considerably, you know, like relatively young, and she had other symptoms that look like this thyroid condition. To me, I think that what happened was that she didn't have any treatment, and she didn't survive it. And they basically had told me that when I went and got um, evaluated for it, that if I didn't do something, I would probably survive another decade or so before my heart or, you know, it went out. So the thyroid so much. Yeah, but I mean, the point is, it's like you're saying, you have this thing where there's this progression, right? So probably killed my grandmother, um, and she probably died, like, completely with, like, an overactive, um, what do you call it, like, her, her, uh, you know, over, just like an overactive metabolism that, that eventually, like, burned out her heart. My mother had the surgical option, and I literally went to and talked to a surgeon because I was kind of nervous about the irradiation option. And the surgeon said, no, no, that's the way to go. Like, that's the thing to do. And so even he right. was saying that even though this was the treatment, you know, in your mother's generation, for you, this is not the way to go. And you should probably go with the irradiation option. It's better for you. And so you do, it does get better, right? It gets better and better and better in these sure. stages as it goes on. And I appreciate the fact that you were able to get into research trials and that you were willing to do that. Um, I think at some point it's less about a willingness and more about a, a an ability. From my experience, people were really, really wanting to get into those trials because usually you're at the point where there's no other treatment available to you. So there isn't. I'm beyond anything that's authorized by the FDA for treatment of yeah. cancer. And clinical trials has kept me alive now for three years. So uh, fantastic. Well, thank you. You know, I mean, just thank you all the way around. Thank you for, um, I mean, I know it's it's just like a cliche to tell My somebody. My contribution to humanity. Well, I mean, there's, there's, the, there's the military thing where people say thank you for your service, and it rings so hollow. But, right. I mean, really, thank you for that yeah. service. And then thank you for serving even with, um, you know, this struggle that you're in, oh, literally life and death. And I just appreciate it so much. And just that one of the things I mentioned before, I certainly can't speak for other people. But for myself, if my death can have meaning, I would so much prefer that to just dying. Right. Right. Indeed. Uh, so something that kind of brought a, a tear to my eye, I'd like to share real quick. Sure. Uh, my son had a, an open house and his uh, teacher, uh, he was in the oh, sixth grade, I think, at the time, grabbed me by the elbow and says, Mr. Richie, you've got to see this. And on the wall, they had my, uh, an essay penned. Uh, tend up that my son had wrote, and I, I, I am paraphrasing, but he said that uh, that he wants to be a biologist. Biologist, he wants to uh, go into cancer research. The cancer is not one thing; it's many. There won't be one cure, but many. Uh, and that he wants to work for the University of Davis Medical Center because they have really good benefits. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't hurt, right? The benefits don't hurt. Um, I, yeah. No, I thought that was that was so cute the way that he phrased it. But if, you know, at, at, in the sixth grade, um, he uh, you know, penned that. Uh, it was pretty neat. Wow. Um, so that was b- way before you were b- way before you were ill. No, I was ill. Oh, so this was at the and time. Oh my gosh! So yeah. you're you're relatively I, young. You're yeah, like a. I'm, well, re- I'm 50. 53, my son at the time oh. was in sixth grade. I've been fighting this for seven or eight years. Um, so it was oh. pretty early on in, in the battle. And, my, and I was very open with my son. I know I, I, I've heard people call in about, well, how do I talk to my children about being an atheist or, or, or lack of belief? And be open, be honest, is the best thing you can do, in my opinion. In most cases, now, there are times that, you, you know, yeah, you may not want to share certain certain things. Wow. But I've been very open with my son from the beginning of this battle uh, to present. Right. Um, I've been very... And I, I, oh. I've told my son, it's not that I want you to be an atheist or think the way I think. That's that's not it. I want you to question everything you're told. That's how you get a Nobel Prize. Uh, 
Wow. You know, so now I think I overcome. like you have a huge reason to be hanging on and fighting. Oh, oh yes. He, yeah. He's given me that reason. And wow. he, you know, he gets straight A's in school, and uh, uh, he's really taking academics seriously. And uh, like I said, you know, I told him, it's, don't believe everything I tell you or everything you're told. Question the world around you. That's what science is about. Uh, this is how we uh, achieve a Nobel Prize. Uh, you, you know, maybe it makes more sense if you tip it upside down. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, don't be afraid to examine things from a whole fresh perspective. All right. So, uh, and he's doing pretty good with that. So I'm very proud of him. Well, good luck with everything. Seriously, I'm so glad that you, you called, and good luck um, with your boy. Good luck with the treatments. I'm sorry for the complications and the, the insurance stress. Um, I'm glad that you have a, a good support network and people there to be around you and rally for you, and um, I just I hope for the best. I keep Mark Twain in mind, you know, he wasn't troubled much before his birth, and he didn't feel he'd be troubled much after his death. I so know. I'm hoping he's right. <laughs> well, that comes, if it goes, you know, it comes to I hope you get to spend many that. more years with that boy. Well, I tell you, I hope to call you back when this is done, uh, either, if we can do it, you know. It, uh, we're looking at having to radiate uh, in and around the thyroid and uh, heart, lungs, uh, I have Hodgkin's lymphoma, so this stuff is everywhere. Okay. Uh, and then I'll be going into a, a transplant, uh, this time with a donor, which uh, uh, makes it that much more complicated without going into the details. No, I understand. And so I'm going to be pretty incapacitated for at least a year. And uh, thankfully, my, my uh, employment uh, is willing to... Uh, Keep my position open uh, for my return. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I really appreciate that. That's that's huge. That is huge. I guess, yeah. I you, but you, I mean, you just shouldn't, you shouldn't even have to be worrying about that right now. Um, honestly, well, you shouldn't. Like, you know, I, I see what's going on. I do too. Uh, I get politics. it. Politics. It terrifies me. We're the we're the richest nation on earth, and we don't provide this, uh, this simple health care. You know, Western Europe's able to do it. They seem to be doing okay. I, I, my former wife was in Canada. My son was sick in Canada. We went into ER. We, uh, I think, uh, I got a, I had to pay five dollars for, for a prescription. That was it. Uh, wonderful system. So, uh, you know, kudos to Canada. I think we had something to learn from our neighbors to do it. All right. Anyway, uh, I hope all goes well with your your condition. Oh yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Don't worry. I mean, it, it's sure. pretty much what it is, and and it's not going to change. Right. So. All right. Well, I living through modern chemistry, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So. Thank you for your call. Awesome. All right, Don. Well, thank you for the work that you do. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. And with that, we have cleared the lines. And I just want to say one more time that we do have dinner um, here at the Free Thought Library on Koenig. And people are welcome to come on out and have some tamales and join us for some conversation. I want to thank the audience and my co-host who had to bug out <laughs> at a hard stop at six. And also the folks who are working production for us and making this happen, the magic behind the screen. So there they all are. <laughs> Thanks to everybody and have a good rest of your week till next Sunday.